All right, so our scripture for this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, the 21st chapter. It's a short one today, verses 1 to 4. This is a very familiar story. Sometimes it's called the widow's might. He looked up and saw rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. He said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in all she had to live on. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So here in our second week of our sermon series on stewardship, I just want to make sure you received a copy of week two's companion resource. And as you recall, uh, this sermon series is based off of what was called the three simple rules of discipleship of the uh, Methodist societies uh, way back when, when Methodism was getting started. And those were do no harm, do good, and then in a modern phrasing of the third one, stay in love with God. Today we're gonna be on do good. Feel free to peruse what you see there before you um, on the companion resource. This one is really meant to be done later, not right now. But um, please give it a a look uh, and uh, please, if you wouldn't mind, let me know if these resources are helping you in any way. Uh, If they're not, that's fine. We don't have to uh, discuss that uh, unless you have a comment. Uh, But uh, please, I'd love to know if these resources have any sort of impact. Okay? Okay, so here in week two of our sermon series on stewardship of resources, I want to share with you my concept of doing good with money. So scripture says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Now let me repeat that because it bears repeating. Scripture says that the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money. Uh, And as you heard in this morning's gospel reading, money can demonstrate great good in a person, right? The widow contributed, and the people contributed. Now, the reading, again, sometimes called the widow's might, suffers from, I would say, one of those frequent moments in this biblical game of telephone we play when we crack open our Bibles and try to read something. The original language and the context doesn't really fit neatly into an English translation. So what I'm going to recommend to those who study scripture with intent is to consider multiple translations when you do that. It's really important, because you see, in my graduate studies, time and time again, as I compared the English text of the Bible to its companion Hebrew or Greek, I found one translation above all to be superior uh, to nearly every other. And again, this is just me. I'm not promoting this. It's just what I found to be true. It was the New American Standard Bible, or NASB. Now, the NASB is certainly not perfect, but it has a faithfulness to the original language that helps a modern reader ask questions that can lead to greater insights. I want to read the story again to you through that version. Here's what it says. Now he looked up and saw the wealthy putting their gifts into the temple treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two lepta coins. And he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them, for they all contributed to the offering from their surplus. But she from her poverty put in all that she had to live on. So that kind of changes things a little bit. Two things here. So number one, raise your hand if you've ever heard of a lepta coin or coins or lepton or anything like that. So lepta is a, it's a plural form of lepton. I'll get to that. 
just hold on to it for now. The second, um, you know, I want you to really listen to what Jesus is saying here. It says that the wealthy shared out of their surplus, but the widow out of her poverty gave all that she had. Okay. So I went to the Holy Land on pilgrimage at the end of uh, January, uh, at the end of January of 2023. And I must say, going into it, I had a very jaded view. Uh, I knew full well from my own studies that Rome uh, raised the city to the ground. I mean, they claim no stone was left on top of the other, which that might or might not have happened, but it was a ruin, okay? So everything that came afterward, it was just understood and settled history for the most part. Uh, everything that came after that was built by someone later on, okay? But like all pilgrims, I did hope to feel or encounter something that would affirm my faith in God. I mean, I wasn't looking for a chorus of angels or anything miraculous, just something, you know? One of the things that struck me the most about the modern and ancient contexts of the land uh, that I was studying was the importance of currency. I had no idea how important currency was back then. The Bible doesn't mention much about it. So the Holy Land at the time of Jesus was an intersection for a lot of different cultures. And each one of them brought their own currency into the region for different reasons. Now the Jewish faithful, even they were not exempt from this because as you know, they were part of a diaspora as the area had been conquered by foreign rulers, they were sent in exile to a bunch of different places. But their religious traditions made them return to Jerusalem, and they'd bring with them the currency of those lands that they inhabited. Um, and they came to do worship in the land of their ancestors according to their traditions. Yes, the owner of the land had changed, even different languages were spoken, and perhaps even the culture had changed or been influenced by whoever was in power, but those sacred traditions were not affected. Coinage was a big deal. Now in those days, the coins usually bore the face or symbol of some ruling monarch, and it had a name, and it had an assigned value. And often the value was determined by how much precious metal was actually in the coin. It was one of the only ways to create a standard for exchange, you see. Exchange rates were vitally important, you know, because to participate in certain institutions, whether it just be sales, you know, buying stuff and acquisition, you had to exchange foreign currency to something compatible with local religious practice. In fact, you couldn't even worship in the Temple of Jerusalem and offer your sacrifices as prescribed there in scripture without converting your currency into the kind that the temple accepted. Now you might remember Jesus being pretty upset about that uh, with some money changers uh, when it came to that practice because some believe that the exchange rates were predatory, you know, that some folks were exploiting religious practice for their personal gain. Now on my pilgrimage, it wasn't really any different. Um, I had to exchange my dollars for new Israeli shekels. And the exchange rate at the time was roughly three shekels for a dollar. Now it's closer to four shekels for a dollar. And yet despite the lesser value of the Israeli currency to my dollars, the cost of goods was virtually identical to the inflated cost of things in some of our wealthier cities. Uh, as we traveled even into the West Bank to Palestinian destinations where the new Israeli shekel wasn't the only money that was accepted, the shekel did kind of remain the standard of the land. It was accepted everywhere. Sure, I could pay in the West Bank with Jordanian dinars or Egyptian pounds, but when I came back to the state of Israel, no, no, new Israeli shekels. In some rare cases, I could hand over some dollars, but I was at the mercy of whatever the exchange rate was going to be at the time. Now, the story of the widow's mite reads differently 
when you understand that the standard of currency accepted at the temple was something called the Tyrian shekel. So Tyre was a city uh, north in the country, even more north than the Galilee. And uh, it's located in what we now call uh, modern day Lebanon. Uh, it was the purest silver of the time, these coins. It was nearly 94% silver. Roman currency, by comparison, was only 80% pure. Now, all foreign coins were exchanged against that standard, the Tyrian shekel, at varying exchange rates. Now, uh, of course, not everybody was brimming with silver. In fact, it would be very dangerous for you to be hauling around sacks of silver, um, so smaller coins were available as a fraction of the Tyrian shekel. But this lepton, okay, so again, the singular form of lepta, that was the smallest denomination available. It was minted in the time before Roman conquest, and it never really stopped being used. But like the penny of our day, it wasn't really considered to have much value. You might think of the difference between a Tyrian shekel and a lepton like the difference between a dollar and a penny. The exchange rate isn't, of course, exact there, but for the purposes of illustration, I think you get the picture. Now, people would come to the, tep uh, to the temple and they would offer their shekels, especially if the time had come for the yearly payment owed under scripture to the temple. It was called the temple tax. And even Jesus pays this tax, by the way, at one point in the gospel record, uh, he asks Peter to catch a fish, and he says, in its mouth will be a four drachma coin. That's called a tetra drachm. The other word for that would be Tyrian shekel. The temple tax was two drachmas, and a Tyrian shekel represented four. So with one coin, Jesus could pay the temple tax for both himself and the apostle Peter. Again, all from a fish's mouth. Okay, so I know that uh, that was a lot more than you thought you were going to get on a Sunday morning about ancient coinage. Uh, but I wanted you to understand what was in play here in this Bible story. So Jesus is watching these rich people putting silver coins as their gifts into the temple treasury. And then this poor widow walks up and takes out two of the most worthless coins available probably not even enough to get her a meal that day. And she gives not just one, but both of them. And Jesus claims that this was all that she had. Wow. Believe me when I say that the treasury probably could have gotten by just fine without those two lepta. But to Jesus, the Son of God, this widow not only shared more than any of them. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying she shared more than every single one of them. Suffice to say, there's a lot more going on here than just money. So when I give, I like to think of my offering as an investment. I don't always give to the church, by the way. My wife and I are pastors. I could be at this church one year, I could be at a different church in a different year. So we're very intentional about the causes that we choose to share money with. And we do this because when we give, it's a sacrifice. I mean, we're pastors, right? Now, I don't say that to say, oh, you know, we don't make very much money, blah, blah, blah. No, we're very well cared for. Thank you, by the way, thank you very much. Um, and we're good at managing money. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. We're both good at managing money. Hey, if you're in the market, if you're looking for somebody, make sure they're good with money. But uh, that surplus that Jesus is mentioning here, yeah, that doesn't really apply to us. We don't have surplus. That would be nice to have surplus. We, like many people, don't have extra when we give, we know that some other area of our life is probably going to have to be uh, put on the back burner for a bit. So our giving is more than just a commitment. 
It's a sacrifice, and it's an investment in something that we really, really care about. Now, you've probably heard from a lot of religious leaders, like myself, talk about uh, giving to the church, you know, and there's this figure of 10% that's floated around. Now, the tithe is certainly a biblical concept. In fact, you'll probably frequently hear the prophet Malachi repeated again and again on this topic, but the widow that Jesus pointed out wasn't tithing, not at all. She was literally giving everything she had. The mentality of someone like that is probably not something that we can relate to. Probably. Maybe. Figures like that call to mind folks like Mother Teresa, right? These sacrificial, saintly figures that represent a form of conviction we might not have. We might even feel shame in the comparison, you know, but I don't believe that we should. I don't, I don't think it's a good idea to do that. Everyone's on their own road. Tithing is fundamentally a form of sacrifice. And while the point I'm about to make might be considered controversial to some, it's what I believe and it's what I teach. You see, I don't think the figure of 10% is what God is ultimately concerned with. I think it's the sacrificial nature of our gifts. You see, for some people, 10% of earnings might not exactly imperil the operation of their household. In fact, for many people, 10% isn't really a sacrifice at all. But for a lot of people, 10%, that's a game changer. If you're living paycheck to paycheck, if you're living hand to mouth, 10% means giving up more than just luxuries, more than just your daily Starbucks. I mean, it could mean somebody doesn't eat, you know? Somebody doesn't get medical treatment. Someone doesn't have lights or heat. Someone can't get themselves around. Now, the act of sacrifice before God is biblical, and it demonstrates a deep faith in God's promises. You know, when I think of giving sacrificially, I think first of Jesus' work on the cross. Jesus gave all that he had to offer an atonement for our sin. That's what we believe as Christians. The flesh of a human and the spirit of God. You know, a, a whole structure of sin existed in Jesus' day that ultimately led to his crucifixion when he began to point out all of the inequity that was going on and the religious elites that were propagating it. His confrontation of their sin ultimately led to his death. And in spite of all that corruption and injustice, God was moved to forgive. Wow. To give sacrificially is to turn something worldly into something spiritual. Sacrificial giving connects us with Jesus, the Jesus that sacrificed for us. It's a way of showing God gratitude, you know, for the generosity that God has put into our everyday lives. But sacrifice alone isn't what I believe God wants. No, you see, sacrifices should bear fruit. I'm sure you've known plenty of people who find almost everything that they do in their day to be a sacrifice. You swear to God they would have little patches of Velcro that they put right here and right here. Oh. God is not looking for professional martyrs. Sacrifices should bear fruit, you see. Sacrifices are investments in God's preferred future, much like the way we sacrifice for the ones that we care about. And why do we do it? We do it because we don't want them to suffer the things that we've suffered. 
Our sacrifice spares them the cruelty of a world that is all too often very cruel. To give in this way is about more than money. It's about time and intention, the sharing of all kinds of resources, and advocacy when our loved ones need it. You know, these were all things that Jesus did with his ministry, by the way, so that people, that society, had thrust to the margins, could be raised up. The structure of society at the time Jesus watched that widow and her two copper coins forced people with very little means to make difficult choices about how they were going to live with a very small minority of people in power who had far more than they could ever need. Hey, that structural sin could never be God's will. Not at all. That's why Jesus said that the widow gave more than all the others. You see, no amount of silver entering that treasury of the temple would be enough to make an offering holy. No, actually, on the contrary, it was just digging a deeper ditch. God is not looking for our money. God is looking for love and justice in our hearts. God wants us to address the inequity behind the situation where a poor widow only has two lepta to her name. Even this she gave to her God, because to her, the investment was worth it. While preparing for this sermon, I finally decided to take it upon myself, as I told the kids, to take back my overgrown backyard. Um, for many reasons, my wife and I really haven't kept it up. In fact, honestly, I think the last time we actually attacked it the way that I did on Friday uh, was uh, actually when she was pregnant with LJ, our youngest. She just had this instinct and she wanted to get down into it, so we spent a whole day. Uh, it wasn't a pleasant day, um, but uh, it, it, it was helpful. Now, I mean, we do a weekly mow, but it, it was ragged. Um, by, Friday, by Friday's end, actually, it was in far better shape. And my wife and I, you know, we're really trying hard to teach our sons the value of hard work, you know, of really investing time and effort into something when the result that you're looking for might take a while to arrive, you know? So as I mentioned to the kids, when my eldest noticed me working, he came right up to me and he said, Dad, I want to help too. What can I do? Those were his words. Oh, what can I do? Praise the Lord. Proud parent moment there, obviously. So I had him collect bundles of weeds and branches. He'd haul them over to the burgeoning pile on the side of our house. It was wonderful. So if I could have the first picture. So that's him helping me clean up for the day. This was at the end of the day when we were moving things out. He's raking the grass. And then the second one. So that photo is of us heading back to the shed to put away our things for the day. My wife took these pictures. Um, and then the third one. Now that's him yesterday with the toolkit that his grandfather gave him. He was working with me to fix his scooter. Now these moments that I'm sharing with you, these have been years in the making. There have been some very deep sacrifices made by multiple generations of our family to invest in my boy. But I dare say it is all worth it. All the bad, all the dark, it's all worth it. Because my son told me that he likes hard work. Amen. Amen. And I love him very much for it. Of course I'm going to love him even if he hadn't said those things. But I love him all the more. And I hope that when it's his turn, he can teach someone else the value of sacrifice and what it means for bringing God's preferred future into being. May the Lord who watches over the widow encourage you and motivate your service. Glory be to God.
and amen.